inland fjord, with 2,000-foot walls carved into the long-range mountains, wild herds of caribou, colonies of puffins and gannets soaring above an ocean where crags of glittering ice drift down for the polar seas. It's a land that few people know well. Come with us now to the wild country of Newfoundland. Some of these icy monsters weigh 200,000 tons and rise 500 feet out of the water. When the light is right, they have the beauty of fine white china. And if you happen to be wildlife photographers like John and Janet Foster, you might rent a dory and a doryman to go with it and row right out into their shadow. At this point, these glacial mountains may have been at sea for three years. They've come a long way from the Greenland ice cap to die in the sheltered bays just a few miles north of St. John's Harbor. This particular iceberg has been grounded and melting since March, and it is now mid-June. Of all the natural forces that combine to shape the special character of Newfoundland, the most influential is the Labrador Current. With the meeting of the icy waters of the Arctic and the warmer southern currents of the Gulf Stream result in a great turbulence and a welling up of nutrient and plankton. And where there is plankton in abundance, the fish feed and flourish in their millions. Where there are fish, there are always the wild birds of the sea, birds that nest high in the cliffs along Newfoundland's rugged coast and on the offshore islands. You consult with the Wildlife Service, and with their approval, cautiously given, you begin a journey that is not without its hazards. There aren't too many days of the year when the oarsmen of Whitless Bay are eager to take you to these craggy islands and allow you to make a waterborne transfer to a dory. The rock ahead is an important bird sanctuary, and only photographers and researchers of serious intent are encouraged to land here. Green Island is south of St. John's, just a few miles off the east coast. From the bird's point of view, it's a well-protected colony because man can only land here when the sea is calm, and that isn't really that often. And of course, if these rocks are wet, say from rain or fog, climbing is almost impossible. One of the reasons that the Wildlife Service doesn't encourage visitors here, in fact, they keep a very close watch on these sanctuaries, is that when you do visit, you scare the birds off the nest. They fly off in enormous numbers. And while they're gone, other birds, predatory birds, like these gulls, will swoop down and steal their eggs. And then, of course, if you, if you disturb them too often, some of the birds would eventually begin to desert. This is a colony of murres. The murres don't actually build a nest here but each bird will lay her single egg out on the bare rock. They seem very scattered and very unprotected. And the bird's territories aren't large. In fact, they're only as, as wide as a bird can reach from her egg. But if you look closely, you'll see the eggs aren't round, they're pear-shaped. And this means that, that if they roll, they'll roll in very tight little circles. Okay. These are razorbill ox. 
And this is a beautiful white-breasted gull known as a kittiwake. They have black feet and black tips on the end of their wings. And we weren't too sure about this little fellow, but we think he's probably a baby black-backed gull. And he'll grow up to quite a size. And there's no mistaking that face. That's a puffin. They nest here by the thousand in tunnels. A deserted puffin colony. The ground has already collapsed over the old tunnels, and now it's a little like walking over bales of hay. We have been warned never to walk over one of the active colonies, because you'd cave in the ground, and you'd seal the bird underground. Puffins are excellent swimmers and divers. They have short, stubby little wings, and they use them underwater for swimming when they're chasing fish like the capelin, which comes in here in June by the thousand. Puffins are now protected by law. They were diminishing seriously for a while, but now the colonies are quite healthy. And when they catch a fish, they'll hold it sideways in their beak. Sometimes you'll see them with four or five fish dangling from the beak. One of the most famous of Newfoundland's bird colonies is at Cape St. Mary's, where hundreds of thousands of gannets cover the sheer cliffs and wheel and scream against the high blue sky. Mating time lasts for several weeks, a time when primeval instincts dictate mysterious fencing motions, a bobbing of bills, the strange and timeless rituals of courtship. The cry is a simple, natural one. Survival, the sweet joy of life. Gannets are a fascinating bird to photograph. They regurgitate the food for their young. If you watch closely here, you'll see a fish sliding from the mother down the throat of the young gannet. This fencing behavior, this is simply a greeting. When the bird flies back to the nest, there's all kinds of little rituals they go through. And this makes photography extremely interesting in a gannet colony. Now, if you watch this bird, it puts its head straight up in the air. This is preparatory to flying. And what it is doing, it's pumping air into great air chambers in the body. And as soon as it has done this, it will take off. Now, the air chambers help it in flight, and there's some speculation that they also help when the gannet hits the water, because they dive with tremendous force. Since time began, Newfoundland has had birds enough to fill its heavens, feeding and growing in the bounty of the sea. But for animals of the land, life has been much harsher. Ever since the glaciers of the Ice Age swept almost all of Newfoundland's thin soil well out into the surrounding seas, leaving the island rocky and barren. Until very recently, Newfoundland has been without many of the species of its nearby mainland. And even today, there are no wolves, raccoons, skunks, or even snakes. But now, thanks to the province's wildlife service, new populations of many animals are being encouraged, including the large and graceful Arctic hare. Brunette Island, off the south coast, is an outdoor laboratory of the wildlife service. And you head there now to watch biologists study the territorial behavior of some four-legged friends. Once, this was a thriving outport, but now it has been abandoned by the people of the sea, the deserted houses remaining as reminders of a way of life now disappearing into the past.
We spent two days on Burnett Island with Jim Inders. And Jim is a biologist with the Newfoundland Wildlife Service. And somewhere out there, there's an Arctic hare wearing a radio transmitter. Jim has caught the hare earlier and fastened the transmitter around its neck with a collar, then released it. What he's doing now is trying to track its movements so that he can learn as much as possible about the way an Arctic hare moves around in its territory. In order to catch them, he uses live traps. These traps are baited with apple flakes. And then when it springs, the hare is captured completely unharmed. Burnett Island is 12 miles off the south coast of Newfoundland. And when the fog blows in here, it's, it's like a Scottish moor. It's a wild, deserted place. One of the foggiest corners of the world. As far south as France, yet as treeless as the Arctic. So similar to the high north is this green tundra land that Arctic life dwells here, including the well-camouflaged willow ptarmigan. You walk carefully through the mist, knowing that at any moment there may be a wild fluttering underfoot. There's a fairly good population on the island. This is really an Arctic bird, but the Labrador current has made ideal tundra conditions for it here on Newfoundland. We've got one. The Arctic hare was introduced fairly recently to Burnett Island. Because it's an endangered species over in the mainland, they're trying to get a reservoir population going here on the island so that they can release some later on the mainland. This one's been caught before, <laughs> many times in fact. He already has his collar, and if you look closely, you'll see his ear tags. In fact, Jim's starting to think that, that he's got a taste for those apple flakes. A nice lunch of apple flakes, and then freedom once more. You'll probably catch him again. The tundra conditions up on the Buchan Plateau in the interior of Newfoundland are very similar to those on Burnett Island. There are some wild Arctic hares up here, even though they're quite scarce. Newfoundlanders have been eating hare, or rabbits as they call them, for some years. So the Arctic hare, and to a much greater extent the snowshoe hare, may become, or may continue to be, a staple food product for the Newfoundlanders. The interior of Newfoundland is dotted with sparkling blue lakes, few of them accessible by road. Here, as in the high north, the small aircraft is the common carrier. And now you hitch a ride to the next part of your assignment. We were most interested in the west side of Newfoundland, north from Burnett Island, up around the area of the Long Range Mountains. There's a new national park up there called Gros Morn. It's a spectacular piece of country. If you were coming across to the west side of Newfoundland, you'd probably take the ferry across from the mainland on Cape Breton Island. It's about 100 miles from Cape Breton over to Port of Basque. Less than a day's drive north from here, Remains have been found of early Viking settlements, and it's quite possible that Viking ships cruised these very waters 500 years before Columbus. For a time, the shore road goes inland, with gently rolling hills on either side. And when the berries are ripe, the fields are never empty.
near midpoint on the western shore, a great new national park is in the making. And one of its features will be a guided walk along the unusual rock formations of Green Point. Green Point attracts geologists from all over the world. If you study these formations, you'll see layers of ancient seabeds. They're thrust up and tilting over. And they reveal strata that's been laid down over millions of years in time. All of these stories to a geologist are exposed here. The wind and the weather has eroded the rocks so that the layers are clearly revealed. Certainly the geologists that we met were very excited by all these formations. And while this part of the beach is almost deserted of humanity, it's teeming with life in other forms. In small pools, behind the rocks, and on every cresting wave, millions of miniature specimens that make up what is known as intertidal life. Periwinkles, barnacles, mussels in numbers to equal the grains of sand. Creatures that live between the tides have to adapt to a very difficult environment. On one hand, they have the pounding of the waves, and then on the other, when the tide goes down, they have to put up with low water and occasionally exposure to sun. But these intertidal pools are really filled with life. The starfish usually have five arms, but this one had six. And these arms are very powerful, so powerful in fact that they can force open an oyster. And if one breaks off, it simply grows a new one. And if you turn one upside down, you can see all the little suction cups waving in the wind. For well, this is where the real strength of the starfish is. They use these little suction cups, both for moving, and for giving that tremendous pressure to open the oysters and the clams. If you walk around here in bare feet, you'll probably discover the sea urchins because they're covered in very sharp spines. Most of them had shells sticking to them. This may be camouflage against predators, like gulls perhaps, because they live here in very shallow water and it's probably an adaptation because the water's so shallow and they're so exposed. Creatures that have only one shell and then a soft underside get their protection by sticking onto rocks. Now, when the tide goes out and they're exposed, they can hold water inside that shell and survive until the tide comes back in again. That's a sea anemone. It's a relative of the Portuguese man of war, and it has filaments that can shoot poison into its prey. And there's another form of intertidal life around here, and that's the kids. There aren't any scientific names here because they showed us a world of Johnny crabs and bloodsuckers and boot crawlers. <laughs> I asked one of them what a boot crawler does and he said, sir, sir, he sucks your blood. The face of Newfoundland is changing but not all at once. One particularly attractive outport that so far has changed hardly at all is the peaceful and prosperous village of Trout River. Life goes on here much as it has for generations. Men fish when the weather allows, rarely travel far from home, rarely want to, for their life is for them a good and complete one. The cove itself is well sheltered, 
to the wide beach and room for gardens. On the upper slopes, there's ample space for the shaggy horses that used to haul the district's timber. And small flocks of sheep keep the grassy terraces cropped close. Change is on its way in the form of a new road from the interior. But for Trout River, it may not be too drastic. The village is completely surrounded by the newly created Grossmorn National Park. Trout River, an authentic working fishing village. Many people hope it will stay that way for a long time to come. Lobster fresh from the sea. We paid a dollar a pound for these. Within living memory, the fishing rights on this coast belonged to France. It was against the law for Englishmen to spread a net or drop a hook. But they did it just the same. One patriarch here remembers being taken prisoner by the French, accused of fishing out of bounds and being clapped in irons. But the French fed him well and soon let him go home to his waiting family. And he was fishing again as soon as the coast was clear. Now these waters are reserved for Canadian fishermen, and the French have gone. Then, as now, the prime catch was cod. The codfish in these waters are among the most numerous and biggest in the world. It was this incredibly abundant marine harvest that brought men to these shores even long before the Vikings of a thousand years ago. Early Indians fished here, and so did the archaic Eskimos of 3000 BC. And on certain rare days of the year, the fish nets yield up more than was bargained for when some passing monster of the deep ventures close to shore and finds himself ensnared in the relentless twine. It's disaster for the basking shark, a gentle creature that lives on plankton, and days of work for the fishermen, patching the torn nets together again. Most big fish come close to shore in search of the cod. And the cod stay close because of the smallest fish of all, the capelin. The waves are literally black with fish when the capelin make their spawning run. They come in with each wave right onto the beach. larger than the female, you can identify him by that long ridge running along his body. Spawning is extremely hard to photograph. It takes place literally in five seconds. You watch for three wriggling fish just as the wave recedes. Two males and one female. That is the moment of spawning. The sand is full of eggs, tiny little eggs. They stay here in the wet sand for about a month, relatively safe from predators, and then they hatch out, and the little tiny fry go back into the sea. With the Cape running, the whole town of Trout River came to life. Men, women, children, dogs, everyone went racing down the beach. And they had nets, and they had buckets, anything that would scoop up fish. The Cape are fried or frozen, or salted, or dried, or smoked, and they make wonderful bait for codfish.
As more and more people find out about this other Newfoundland, the shore road that leads up the rugged west coast is destined to become one of the more traveled roads of the Atlantic provinces. It's possible to picnic and pitch a tent there now in a few hospitable settings near the side of the road. And plans are in the works for new campgrounds to accommodate the half million visitors a year expected when the new park is fully developed. Grossmorn National Park, mountain plateaus, deep fjords, grasslands and bogs, and miles of magnificent coastline. When you hear a spotted sandpiper complaining vigorously, it's always a reminder to be careful where you put your feet. They nest on the ground and it's all too easy to step on their eggs. However, in this case, we could hear tiny peeping sounds coming from the bushes. Hey, listen, do you, do you hear another peeping sound? Oh, here, here. Where? I heard again. Wait a minute. Look, hey, look, look, look that one, Marcy. Break down. There he is. There he is. Look. They are very, very young. They leave the nest almost immediately after hatching. In the shore's long struggle to maintain itself against the sea, everything yields, leaning backwards, driven into permanently bent postures and statue-like shapes. The technical term for this ultra-tough, wind-carved miniature forest is Krumholz. But in this beautiful, misty land, it goes by the gentler name of Tuckamore, or colloquially, Tuck and it brings out the happy child in all of us. The other Newfoundland, where giant coastal cliffs stand watch over hundred-foot sand dunes, dunes that encroach on every living branch and then roll on, exposing a ghostly forest, silvering in the salt air. Dunes are delicate formations, subject to rapid shifting when their clinging grasses are disturbed. Yet they're favorite places for travelers seeking serenity and contemplation. This is not the most hospitable bathing country in the world, unless you're a Viking or a young Canadian who doesn't mind that even in July there is ice in the water less than 100 miles north of here. But it's great country for walking, and it's a photographer's paradise, whether your subject be sand hills, or distant mountains, or the figure of your wife Janet, who once was a dancer with the National Ballet, and has never quite forgotten the steps, or the music that goes with them. Bog is sometimes thought of as an ugly word, bog. But in the watery Newfoundland bogs, just behind the sand hills, you can find some of the most beautiful flowers in the land, a riot of color to equal that of an alpine meadow. the other Newfoundland, where the rains of summer often fall on snow patches left over from winter. When you drive through here, there are lush green hills on one side of the road, and on the other, a yellow panorama that resembles nothing so much as the rocks of the moon. This area of Grossmorn is known as the Serpentine, an extraordinary outcropping of the Earth's mantle that attracts rock hounds and geologists alike. It was a very hot day, 
and it seemed to us that the black flies were a very special breed. The local people refer to them as the Newfoundland Air Force. I know I counted 32 bites on my hands alone. Of course, they hatch in running water, and they need blood because without blood they can't breed, so I guess we kind of made their day. The climb to the top and back is rugged, but can be handled comfortably in a long afternoon with natural drinking fountains along the way. Ice water, literally. The climb to the top of the Serpentine is worth it for many reasons. Among them is a close-up view of these cousins of the icebergs, patches of unmelted snow that freshen the air on a hot July day. These snow banks are sculptured by wind and rain and weather. They're really marvelous to photograph. If you break these yellow rocks, you discover a beautiful dark green interior in great contrast to the yellow weathering on the outside. There's something totally fascinating about the bare yellow rock up on the serpentine. And there's almost no soil here. There are just a few tiny little areas tucked among the rocks that support life. And for just a moment, as you break over the top, it's a little like the old familiar Laurentian shield. Thin soil, coarse grass, and boulders strewn everywhere as though by some friendly giant of gross morn. At the upper rim of the serpentine, you drop your packs and give your heart and lungs a moment or two to readjust. The climber's ultimate reward, the view from the top, wild country. Somewhere down in those valleys, newly introduced species of animals are beginning to thrive, and older ones are beginning to flourish again. Long thoughts as the afternoon wears on, and dusk turns flaming red over Grossmorn Mountain. In the sometimes special language of Newfoundland, a lake is known as a pond, and a pond is known as a steady. But when it comes to the salmon rivers of the interior, there's no confusion at all. Just a campus paradise at the end of a back country road. These are the headwaters of the Upper Humber, one of the great salmon rivers of the world, right at the edge of Grossmorn National Park. There are increasing numbers of Canadians, like John and Janet, for whom observing is enough. Just looking at one of the great spectacles of nature, the journey of the Atlantic salmon back from the ocean, fighting upstream against raging waters, leaping rapids and waterfalls under the constant threat of other species, including man, heading back to the spawning grounds where life began. On any given day and season, you might find yourself casting a line beside a surgeon from Boston, a lord from Edinburgh, or a voyager from British Columbia come to measure the fighting qualities of the Atlantic salmon against those of the West Coast variety. One difference is that Pacific salmon spawn and die. Some Atlantic salmon make this journey several times.
Some of Canada's finest salmon rivers are here. Often the headwaters are accessible only by air. The interior of Newfoundland, where the roads don't go. Seen from an aircraft, an impressive panorama of lakes, woods, and gray-brown rocks. Moose have done extremely well in Newfoundland. The first two were introduced way back in 1878. A few more were brought in in 1904, and they've done very well. They prospered all over the island, and they've been a good source of food for Newfoundlanders. Though there's some concern now about overhunting. Moose have no large natural predators in the animal world. Man is really his only predator because the timber wolf was wiped out in Newfoundland quite a long time ago. The pine marten is considered rare in Newfoundland, although it may be making a slow comeback. The marten likes red squirrels as food, and as the squirrel multiplies, then life becomes a little easier for the marten, although they also eat mice, shrews, chipmunks, even young hares. One thing that does help creatures like the moose and to some extent the Arctic hare is the occasional forest fire. Fire is a very natural phenomenon and it creates new growth and fresh browse for creatures like the moose that depends on the terminal twigs of little bushes. We spent one entire day trudging up and down a series of hills, knee-deep in bog and tangled undergrowth and hotly pursued by our own personal little cloud of black flies. We were being guided to a bald eagle's nest, which is just below a cliff. For some reason, the nest was empty, but it would have been a perfect setup for photography. So, Joe went fishing. It just happened that his favorite pool was right beneath the empty nest. There was no eagle here, but there was sign of another great bird of prey, probably an owl, a regurgitated pellet and it contained the entire leg and foot of a small bird. However, the day was not without its rewards. Not a bald eagle, but a beautifully marked osprey. The osprey is endangered in many parts of the world, threatened by pesticides in its fish diet. It's a splendid soaring bird with a great hooked beak and long curved talons to grasp its prey. And then the most exciting moment of the journey. There's a large herd of caribou on the Buchan Plateau. That's a vast rolling tundra in south central Newfoundland. These are woodland caribou, often simply referred to as Newfoundland caribou. The herd seemed very healthy. We saw a number of young calves. They were very beautiful, but their parents looked a little patchy. They were losing their winter hair. Yet in this state, they were very well camouflaged against, against the rock and the tundra and the low bushes. There's some evidence that there were once immense herds of caribou all over Newfoundland that were hunted by the, the Beothic Indians. 
course, the coming of the white man changed all this. The herds really dwindled for a while. Now they're doing considerably better. There's about 17,000 caribou in Newfoundland today. Flying now over country that is still relatively unexplored. Forest lands and rolling hills most of the way. And then a sudden dramatic rise as you approach the long range mountains. How many people in all of Canada, or elsewhere for that matter, have ever imagined fjords in Newfoundland to rival those of Norway and British Columbia? Western Brook Pond, a majestic inlet where the canyon walls measure more than 2,000 feet from the edge of the cliffs to the surface of the water. A freshwater fjord six miles inland. In another year or so, there will be organized access to this fascinating part of the other Newfoundland. But as of now, it's a half day's journey across the bog on the West Coast Road. And you begin the journey on foot. One day in the future, there'll be a boardwalk across here. And visitors, young and old, will stroll three miles in comfort from the roadway to the pond itself. In the meantime, the trip across the soggy, quaking bog is wet, strenuous, and interesting. The bog flowers grow in rich profusion. The land shakes and reminds you that it was only recently pure swamp and may not evolve into solid ground for hundreds of years. Evergreen trees are everywhere, some tiny, others reaching several feet. And their almost microscopic growth rings indicate the oldest of them to have been here some 400 years. And you look forward to the fjord itself, a deep gash torn from the ancient rock by the retreating glaciers of the last ice age. But that part of the journey will have to be by water. We found it almost impossible to believe that this great fjord is really unknown country to most Canadians. Certainly, it was new to us. It's a little hard to describe the emotions you feel at the foot of these immense walls. Surprise, astonishment, certainly. against canoeing here. Our boatman told us that when the wind blows through Western Brook Pond, you can see the spray going right up over the cliffs. And looking up those, those 2,000 foot walls, we began to imagine what it must look like from the top. One park planner has proposed a campground in the remotest corner of Western Brook Pond and a gradual climbing trail to take you 2,000 feet to the top. But as of now, 
The best way to make the ascent is by helicopter. Many people consider that this section of the Long Range Mountains, where Westernbrook Pond carves back into the hills, is probably the most spectacular wilderness country east of the Rockies and south of the Arctic. We went to the top with Don Learmonth. He's a superintendent of Grossmoor National Park. But this was his first trip to the top. It was new for all of us. And Don's had quite a history. He spent a couple of years in the Northwest Territory. He ran the Yukon Forestry Service for three and a half years. And he has also been the superintendent of Banff National Park in Western Canada. He spent several years in Ottawa behind a desk. And he told us that when they asked him to take on this special assignment, come here and be superintendent of Gross Morn, it took him about two minutes to make up his mind. Finally, airborne again, heading east to St. John's and one of the most fascinating air patrols in peacetime aviation. This is an international mission flown off the coast of Newfoundland by the U.S. Coast Guard, paid for by 16 maritime nations whose ships ply the busy North Atlantic. Its purpose? to trace the movements of icebergs and pack ice and broadcast that critical information to all the ships at sea. The history of this patrol dates back to one of the greatest marine disasters in history, the sinking of the Titanic in 1912 by an iceberg. Forty miles out from shore, you watch for one particular island known to naturalists around the globe and then you spot it, dead ahead. Half a mile long, quarter of a mile wide, and rising 46 feet out of the sea. Incredible Funk Island. Nesting ground of more than one million birds. Here, most visibly, are the forces that have molded Newfoundland, an island framed by the sea. Arctic ice and water, the Labrador current flowing eternally down from the polar seas. Each massive sparkling mountain of ice, a reminder of the glaciers that carved the land a few thousand years ago. Forces as much a part of the wild country as the sun that warms the flowers in the tundra meadow, or the wind that sweeps across the fjords and forests and river valleys of the island we know as Newfoundland. <laughs> 